welcome film is brought on Real World Agile. Thank you. So yeah, I think it's fair to say this is the, the most uh, experienced and senior audience that have had this talk. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. I might be teaching you to suck eggs. But um, yeah, I'm going to talk about real world agile. But I'm not really sure I can do this, to be honest, because I'm sort of sick of agile. Because agile in 2016 is people who are doing agile. It's coaches telling me that their teams are fully agile. It's, it's scrum masters that own the delivery of user stories that are assigned to his team. It's people valuing agile certificates. It's not, not an agile software development life cycle, but the agile software development life cycle that has mode decisions, acceptance management, and test sprints. This is why we can't have nice things. Yeah? So the first rule of real world agile is there is no agile. Okay? Maybe no agile is a bit too far. Yeah, I'm not trying to create a new movement here, but I am going to need your help today. Okay? So uh, you're going to have to do more work later but you need to do some more work now as well. It's possible that these five letter, this five-letter word is sneaked into the rest of my slides. So if you see it, I need you to boo, OK? And I mean genuinely, I want you to boo, not rubbish, repressed British booing. I'm talking about proper pantomime stuff, OK? And I'm going to test you, OK? Test-driven. <laughs> not bad. I'm going to give you a little bit of help. <laughs> OK, better. OK, so we're going to get rid of that. There we go, there we go. OK, so we'll get rid of that. Um, OK, and now we will start properly. OK, so... I'm not going to get bored of this. You might, I'm not. OK, so agility ceremonies. Still sort of doesn't sound quite right, actually. So I think what we need to do is we need a good old definition slide. So ceremony. Let's look at what this actually means, OK? A formal religious or sacred observance. Strict adherence to conventional forms any formal act or observance. And here's the kicker, especially a meaningless <laughs> one. So is, is this seriously, is this our, our cadence? Is this the cornerstone of our process and, and how we deliver? Um, so obviously, I don't want to make this whole thing about semantics and, and naming, but I think the, the thing to think about here is when we talk about ceremonies, you know, make sure that we're thinking about what the, what the context is and what the real value is, and make sure that we, we check that constantly um, and avoid these things, as we've all seen, becoming a a sacred observance or, or a solemn rite. So we're going to go in and talk about some of the things that sort of I've seen and I think that we've seen in, in various different sort of ceremonies, uh, meetings, whatever you want to call them. So, so we have a development team. We've got a, we've got a, we've got a BA here. We've got a, a, a senior developer. He gets called an architect so he can get the right pay grade. He uses that stick for pointing at boxes on, uh, on whiteboards. We've got our UX. We've got a QA in the corner. Got our cute DevOps down here, look. <laughs> and then we've got four, four graduate developers, because if we've got one senior developer, why would we need any more? <laughs> it's 10.15 in the morning, because obviously 10 o'clock would be the middle of the night. Um, they're looking at their delivery lead. <laughs> <laughs> and they're thinking, what did I do yesterday? Look at it. Look at his face. He's there going, please go anti-clockwise. I was pairing with Frodo. Please go anti-clockwise. <laughs> But it's seriously, I mean, I don't know how many of you actually use these three questions now, but I, I hate these three questions. I mean, the whole th purpose of it, what did you do yesterday? It's so sort of accusing, it's so unempowering, and it's managing the people. And, you know, my feeling about Agile is that it's, you know, people have to be managed, but stand-up is not about managing people. Why are we going around a group of people sort of asking them what they did? And I'm sure you've all seen this. The problem is it's, it's not just that it's unempowering, Nobody is listening to what anybody else is saying because they're constantly thinking, what did I do, what did I do, what did I do? And they're context switching between what you did, what you did, what you did. And it all kind of becomes, you know, um, sort of removed from the, from the work. So um, my preferred way, and I'm sure lots of, lots of you do this, is to, to do a technique called, called walking the board. So I don't know, again, how many people do this, but walking the board, really simple change from the standard three questions. Instead of going around the people, we go around the work. Yep. So you pick, uh, you know, a particular card, and you talk through that card, whoever has worked on it um, updates the, the whole team on the status of, of that card. Um, doesn't matter which order you go in, you can always do sweep ups to catch people at the end who maybe haven't said anything and work out what they were working on and, uh, and this sort of thing. But it means that we're, we're managing the work. Um, one of the things I've often found on this that we've ended up sort of emerging as a, as a habit, I guess, rather than a practice, is that um, during the day when a pair actually, or you know, a person actually changes the, the status of a card, what they'll actually do is they'll, they'll sort of walk up and, and see that, that's clever. Um, they'll, they'll put it, put it on, 
they'll, they'll put it on the line. Um, uh, just as a, as a kind of a token of the fact that we have completed the definition of moving that work on. Um, and then at stand up the next day, you t tend to talk about the things that are on the line first because they are significant because they have changed state. So you talk about the things that are online, and then again, the team together at stand up can, can kind of move it into the, uh, the, the sort of column formally. And it's just quite a nice way you know, for teams to get used to, to understanding what the state change, state change means. Um, I guess while we're talking about um, the boards, I'm not going to call it a scrum board or a Kanban board or uh, even an, I'm not going to say the word, but even a, an A board, um, just whatever, work board, whatever you want to call it. Um, let's talk about some other things. So the, the headings, um, what I normally say is I'll tell you exactly what headings you should have, and I don't know because obviously the headings that you have on any sort of um, team board should depend very much on the context of the team, the people that you have, the sort of work that you're doing, uh, the, sta the stage of the project that you're in, etc., etc., etc. One of the a couple of anti patterns that I've certainly seen in in the naming of columns on team boards is if the if the columns reflect disciplines of the team, then it suggests to me that you are not, as Scrum says, carrying the work as a team. Um, you're just doing many waterfalls and passing the work between disciplines. So you know if you have in analysis, in dev, in QA, that doesn't feel particularly uh, uh, particularly as though it has a lot of agility in it. Let's say uh, the other one is blocked columns. Um, I don't get the blocked column. For, for me, if something's blocked, it is it is blocked in the status that it is. Um, and you want to highlight the status that it is when it's blocked. So you know, I like to highlight things in place and mark them with a bit of information about why it is why it is blocked. Um, one of the important things about that is that if something's blocked, it doesn't disappear from your whip limit. It's still a work in progress, even if it's even if it's blocked. And you know, you want to highlight the fact that you've got a number of things. Uh, in progress that are blocked, otherwise you are breaking your whip limits by default by throwing things into a column on the side that nobody really cares about. Um, minimum whip limits as well, I think. Uh, so for me, the, having whip limits on a board is one of the, the easiest things that you can do to improve, improve the flow and improve the process. Um, but minimum whip limits are useful as well if you want to sort of ensure supply. Um, so we had a situation this morning, we don't have whip limits on our board at the moment. Um, I keep trying to convince people to, but obviously I'm not going to tell them they have to. Um, and we had a situation this morning where we thought we had work ready and then we didn't, so everybody has a nice little panic, panic dance. Um, who owns the board? Yeah, see, I knew you'd get that right. Yeah, obviously, if, uh, if any individual claims that they own the board, they're probably a sociopath. Um, so, yeah. Um, okay. Save our souls. It's a scrum of scrums. So, scrum of scrums is one of the worst ceremonies that I've seen. So if you take the things that you see in uh, sort of stand-ups and scrums, then it seems to be amplified quite often in scrum of scrums. So the anti-pattern I've seen most often is that all of your scrum masters are the previous team managers or, or you know, departmental managers, and then the scrum of scrums has a more senior manager, and they have kind of a group management meeting at, at the scrum of scrums. And I've actually seen a situation where people have um, done, ha they, they've replicated all of the story cards from all of the individual uh, scrum boards on a scrum of scrum boards and talked about the status of everyone and asked the three questions to every member of, of the scrum of scrums, which I think we all agree uh, isn't necessary. So for me, there's only two things that you, know, you do at scrum of scrums. One of them is optional. So uh, the first one, which I think is really what scrum of scrums is about, is to discuss dependencies. So I guess John wrote the dependencies with a handshake blog. Is that you? Yeah. Um, you know, it's a chance for the teams to get together and and, and actually talk about the dependencies, and we'll talk more about dependencies later. Uh, and then the other is assistance, and that's both requests for and, and offers of. So it could be we found this new thing, which is really interesting, it might be useful, or it could be you know, we, our person that's an expert in this is missing, can anybody help us? And, and it's really to have those, those sorts of conversations. So planning. So we talked about dependencies a moment ago. Um, one of the techniques that I find quite useful when, whenever anybody mentions uh, sort of dependencies or deadlines or milestones is is to ask them to categorize uh, how what sort of deadline it is uh, using these four types so the first one is it's a it's a legal deadline and if we if we miss this then somebody's probably going to end up in in jail yeah the second one is it's kind of regulatory and it means that we might lose a license to operate or we might be prevented from from doing business you know entirely a third is contractual which could mean an above the above the line marketing campaign or something but it, we're going to be in breach of some sort of contract. And then there's everything else, which 
when it comes down to it, it's kind of political, you know, and it's normally that somebody's made a promise or, you know, or, or somebody sort of, you know, is, is trying to make a particular point. And, and that's fine. But once you've gone through this, everybody suddenly, you know, has to kind of recognise that their particular <coughs> deadline they're talking about is slightly less important um, th than they were claiming it was. And obviously, if a deadline is a dependency that someone else has on you and, and they have a legal requirement or things, then they, those things cascade. But if, if you can't find uh, upstream or downstream, depending on the way that you look at it, one of those other things, then you know, the, the importance of those deadlines goes down to some sort of more nego negotiable um, points, I think. My favourite uh, quote about deadlines, is it Douglas Adams? Um, yeah, Douglas Adams says, you know, oh, I, you know, I love deadlines. I like the sound that they make when they wash by. I think what we should, the way we should treat deadlines generally. <coughs> okay, so we're talking about planning. So to E or not to E. So what are we talking about? Uh, okay, obviously um, <laughs> estimates. I'm not going to talk about estimates or no estimates in any detail. Normally, because at most conferences where I do this, there's a whole bunch of conversations already happening about estimates and no estimates, and it's it's too big a uh, too big a sort of subject to get into. My normal thoughts are to, if you can avoid forecasting, avoid forecasting. Yeah, you know, don't forecast for the sake of forecasting. If you do have to forecast, then the, 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 the sort of the guidance that I would give is understand the context of why you are giving a forecast. So quite often, people will go into forecasting and estimating uh, in quite a systematic way, and they won't always necessarily know why. Somebody says, when is X going to happen? Um, and people don't necessarily ask, well, why, why do you need to know when X is, is going to happen? And the difference between a forecast for, um, you know, for a, a dependency, as we talked before, or the difference between a forecast for a, um, a feasibility um, sort of um, on, on a piece of work versus a, an actual cost estimate versus planning and et cetera all, always changes. Um, be really cautious about sort of granularity, uh, particularly the, the precision um, that, that you, we report forecasts in versus our confidence. So you get the classic situation where people report forecasts in a really sort of detailed way down to the amount of days, but really they don't know it that well anyway. But the, the sort of forecasting mechanisms that we often use mean that we roll up sort of, you know, s sort of quite low cost, uh, low, low uh, confidence estimates into these, these really large cases. I know sometimes people um, make their, um, th they make their uh, error what I'm looking for. Um, they make their margin of error kind of you know, public and visible, which is, to be honest, a waste of time. Because if you say you know, 102 days plus or minus 21 days, then the very next time it gets reported, it'll be 101 days. So, a uh, complete waste of time. Uh, and I guess the third thing is around yesterday's weather. And I don't mean this down to the we have a velocity and we do all of our planning and forecasting based on a velocity. But I think considering how cynical we are, um, developers are actually really optimistic. Uh, and development teams are really optimistic in terms of thinking that things are going to get better. Everybody always seems to think the thing that we are doing now is the hardest thing in the world. Like, oh, it's the beginning of the project, therefore we've got all of this boilerplate work to do, but things are going to be better next week. But they're not, because next week you're going to have dependencies, and then next week you're going to have sort of different pressures. So I think it's just to make sure that you are relatively honest with yourself in using past uh, performance or you know, past records to predict uh, future performance. I hate these cards. <laughs> I don't understand. I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the introductory stuff in a minute. But I, I don't understand why, when you are teaching somebody something new like planning, you introduce a concept like Fibonacci. Yeah, I understand the theory of of, of having things that are at different uh, sort of you know you know uh, increasing increasing gaps. But but why why teach a whole generation of people who didn't know about Fibonacci about Fibonacci when you're trying to teach them something else? And I mean these are ridiculous. The it's what? No, uh, yeah, okay, yes, yeah, sorry, you're right, not generation. Um, yeah, yes, a whole group of people, a whole group, a whole group of people, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, you know, the, the difference between half and, and 100 in the same set of cards, I, I don't understand how you, would, how, you would, how you would use that. So these are, I'm sure you've seen these, these are my favourite cards. So these are the Noble Estimation cards from uh, Pavel Borzynski. You, you can go and buy them at Lunar Logic. Um, so you can still do planning poker, but uh, there's only three possible sizes. There's one, there's two effing big, and no effing clue. Yeah? <laughs> and and uh, genuinely, I actually pref much prefer this, this approach to, to estimation because if you, use, if you do planning poker and you want to do that, and there is a benefit to having the team discuss the complexity and to discuss how well they understand it, but what I've seen happen when people are using sort of story points and cards is that when, when, when you've got a difference in, in opinion, yes, you discuss it, but the outcome normally is 
horse trading or negotiation, and or it's the you know the the highest paid person's opinion or the most vocal person's opinion, and you actually lose the benefit. Whereas in this case, you know, there's there's clear actions. If it's one, it's fine. You do it. You know, and one means it's the size of our stories. Um, you know, if it's too big, then you have to slice it. Um, and actually, that's the most interesting thing I find in working in iterative generally. The hardest thing is, re is consistently re-slicing work. And it really makes you think about the meaning of it, and it makes you really be iterative and revisit. And no matter how often I do it, I get it wrong all the time. I constantly realize that we've not re-sliced something that we could have, or we've, re you know, we've sliced something in the wrong way. And the more that you revisit, the more that you discuss how you could recut work, I think the better we are at, at, at iterative. Who knows what this is? You can guess what this is. Yeah, okay. You, no, sh so, shuhori, um, as a lot of the agile lean stuff, Japanese uh, terminology, comes from martial arts backgrounds and is about learning. So, it says that there are three stages of learning that you should go through. So, shu being basically follow and obey, you know, ha being to um, sort of, you know, challenge and, and change, and re being transcendence, if you want to be really sort of spiritual about it. But it it sort of winds me up a bit because it makes sense. If you're talking about something which is building muscle memory, then yes, there's, there's a benefit in just obeying. It seems to be really misused in what we do, which is knowledge work, because I don't really understand the idea of telling people just to obey, just do it, just go through the motions, because I think quite often you don't end up, end up actually learning what you need to learn. And I think the, the other way that Shu is described, which I much prefer, is the fact that it's, it's to take a heuristic approach, meaning you, you embrace the values, but you don't worry about the optimization. And actually, that's what's often missed in teaching, is that people come in and coach and teach, and, and they don't necessarily extol the values as much as they should. And the term that I keep hearing now, the, actually the, the American term for these, so obviously they should be called stabilizers, but in fact, in America, they get called training wheels. I keep hearing this over the last few years. So I've <coughs> asked a question of a team about why they're doing something, and they'll say, because the coach told us. And I'll ask the coach, why are you doing it in this way? And they'll go, it's training wheels. And it had always annoyed me, and I hadn't quite worked out why. And um, it's one of those, I, I like metaphors, and I like kind of breaking metaphors as well. So it suddenly occurred to me, I've got kids who are of, of bike riding age, and um, they don't use these now. now. This is not the recommended approach to learning to ride a bike. This is the recommended approach to learning to ride a bike, which is a balanced bike. And the reason is, when you have stabilizers or training wheels on, it completely changes what the definition of riding a bike. Yep. You, know, you don't have to balance. You can pedal in a way that you can't pedal when you don't have stabilizers because you are, you are static. It changes the steering dynamics of the bike entirely because you're on three or four wheels rather than two. So a balanced bike, you, you just scoot, you scoot, you scoot, as the name would suggest. And then um, at some point, you'll switch to a bike that has, has pedals. And the idea is you'll start pedaling really quickly. And I thought it was great as a metaphor for learning because what we often see is that people add all these extra things onto processes in order to, to make them learnable, but often they'll miss the actual essence of, of what you're trying to teach. So I much prefer the idea of stripping the actual ideas down. And so Fibonacci and things like that is an example. It's like adding complexity on to a process rather than just stripping it down to its, its minimal approach. So I've got an example of this that I've certainly used. So story writing is a classic example where People talk about, you know, uh, all of the, you know, either talk about given when then acceptance criteria, talk about, um, you know, as our I want so that, etc. And all these sort of different ways of, of getting people to write stories. And they'll normally do that the first time that somebody's even heard the word story. You know, they'll talk about the uh, invest criteria and all of these different things at once. And they never seem to actually just talk about trying to capture something that we can talk over, which, you know, talks about a, a piece of... Of, of capability in a way that we can examine it and discuss it and, and debate it. So I'll sometimes just say, you know, the first thing, let's just do who, what, why, which obviously is a thinly disguised, you know, as a, I want so that, but it's, it's not saying, people aren't going, oh, what was it, as a, was it, it's, it's, you know, really simple. And then this is the worst sentence that's ever been written. But on the back, I will ask them to write things that will describe how we will know once we have done this thing, whether this reason is solved for this person, yeah? And that's what we would call acceptance criteria, yeah? But I don't, wouldn't necessarily even use the word acceptance criteria. I'd just say, when you look at this after we've done this thing, how will you know that we've done it right? And it, it sounds really obvious when you say it, but it's just a very simple 
heuristic approach to get people using physical cards, you know, writing down some acceptance criteria and describing uh, you know, a problem um, in, in a way where you will actually be able to be able to evaluate. Okay, so enough of planning. Showcases, demos. They're often really bad, aren't they? <laughs> it's kind of, when you, you have a demo and it's underwhelming, it's worse than not having a demo at all a lot of the time. And I think one of the reasons is that people often seem to think that a showcase or a demo is a progress report. And I think it's not. You know, the, it's actually an amazing opportunity. So uh, you know, a demo and showcase is about promoting your product. I'm not going to say project, yeah, your product. So whatever the thing is that you are building, it's a chance to really promote it. And I know in most organisations, the people that attend the showcases actually ends up varying because of availability and things. So people might not have been at the last, at the last showcase. It might be new and you know, there might be new people turning up. So I think you take a holistic approach to say, this is what our product is now. You may discuss what some of the, the changes have been in the last sort of sprint or in the last, in the last um, you, know, uh, you know, few sprints, depending on the, the cadence that you're using for your showcases, but it's all about promotion and obviously using compelling scenarios from the perspective of the user. So the amount of times I've people s seen people demo one story at a time, even when the story is really hard to demo. And so the story is, you know, this is us exercising an API through some Swagger documentation. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, brilliant. Um, so yeah, you know, ma make, it, make it real for people who aren't developers or who aren't in the team on a, on a daily basis. And the, the thing is to let people get excited. So I would normally say a showcase should be half demoing things that you've done and half letting people talk about the ideas that they have from the demo that you've done. And again, I've been in showcases where somebody said an idea and then a product person or a scrum master or a BA has said, oh no, we're not doing that, and sort of shut the conversation down. And it seems a real shame because that person's going to sort of just be like, oh, I don't, you know, they don't know all the background and they're just going to kind of go away and think, okay, whatever, I don't really care about that product anymore. And that's the worst thing within an organisation that you can do, because I think unless you've got a whole organisation caring about your product, it's very difficult to, to get anywhere. Okay, so retro. The, I can't remember what the, the, the quote comes from, isn't it? So I think it's from the XP stuff. It's saying, you know, you should, you should retrospect, uh, you know, for an hour a week, unless you don't have time, in which case you should retrospect for two hours a week. Yeah? And I think retrospect, retrospecting is not necessarily about retrospectives. So we get into the, a real habit with this particular ceremony of doing just, you know, you must do it and you must do it in this way. And I don't think it's about that. I think for me, retrospectives are, or retrospecting is mindfulness for teams. You know, it's a time away from doing the actual work to think about doing the work. It's kind of a, a, a meta, meta case. Um, and so, you know, you don't necessarily need to have whole team retrospectives every sprint. You know, you can allow people to go off in pairs. You can allow people just to go and write notes and blog about the project to the rest of the team, or, or whatever it is, but something that lets people get outside of the, the usual case. I don't, I don't believe the fact that a retrospective must be the whole team every time and it must have actions and things like that, as long as it's giving you a chance to consider from, you know, your project from a non-pure delivery perspective, then I think that's what matters. One of the practices that I mentioned in one of these really early talks, and people said, oh, I hadn't even heard of it, and I'm sure most of you have, is, is safety checks. Uh, how many people have had a retrospective in the last month? Okay, not that many, actually. Uh, and how many people did safety checks? Cool. Okay, so I'm not saying that, do, yeah, have people heard of safety checks here? Yeah, okay, most people have, cool. Um, uh, you don't see it very often, and it's not something that I think should necessarily be done everywhere, but I think it's, it is useful, particularly with new teams or when there's new members in teams. So I'll go through this quickly, you've seen it before, but um, safety checks, you, ask, you give people a post-it note, the line down the middle, and ask them two questions. How comfortable are they receiving feedback? And they give you an answer, and how comfortable are they giving feedback? And they give you another answer, and this is a typical sort of answer that people might give you. So I'd plot those on a whiteboard, and this is typical to what you would get. Obviously, you've got our sociopath back again, um, <laughs> who's number 10 in giving feedback. But, um, but this is almost, almost what happens, and it's, it's quite a useful feature, because one case is that you don't get this result, in which case you probably want to really consider whether you want to run the retrospective in the way that you were planning to run the retrospective, particularly if you were going to ask people to contribute and, 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 and talk, about the, you know, talk about problems. But if you do get this, which, as I say, is very typical, then it, it becomes self-reinforcing because typically everybody is much happier receiving feedback from others than they are giving other people that feedback. So you almost get that sort of that positive feedback cycle, which is, oh, actually, well, if everybody else is happy to receive it, maybe I should be happier to give it, and, and, and it can really help open, open people up. Ooh.
to be honest, this is more than just a boo. That's just trolling. Okay, they're, they're, they're not practices for uh, the A word. There's not four of them. Um, if you go back to the XP stuff, there was a big debate over whether they're even practices. I think there was a conversation on XTudes. Some of you remember? Okay. Uh, if you look at the XP wiki, it talks about somebody having uh, guitar lessons or ukulele lessons or something, and the fact that practices can 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 give the wrong idea. But I am going to talk through uh, some common engineering thingies that may aid. Agility, some of which were made popular by extreme programming. So if you're happy with that, then we can go. This takes sort of the format of those horrible memes that go around around, this is what my, you know, my partner thinks that I do, this is what my mum thinks I do, but hopefully slightly less annoying. Um, so, so we've got what people often think this is and you know, wh wh what, it, what it really is. So you know, TDE, I don't know if you can see what that is. It's the IKEA chair. Yeah, TDE is not testing. I know you guys know this, but you know, test and development is not about testing, it's, it's about design or I prefer organic things, so it's about how to grow software. Um, the, the point of uh, test room development specifically is about creating um, components that are, are nicely modular. So the idea when you write a <coughs> test is that rather than having only one client of a piece of code that you write, which is the actual client in the software, you have two from day one because you have the test and the thing that will be consuming the, the software that you write. So it's really about driving out software that, that works in a modular fashion. And I think most people here that are, are developers will, will sort of recognize that a test, it's really annoying when that just keeps going, isn't it? Um, we'll move on. Uh, a test-driven approach um, y you know, really helps. Cre creating testable code tends to help create maintainable code, et cetera. But it's not about testing. So pairing is, <laughs> is, is, is not mentoring. Um, the amount of times I'll hear people talk about pairing and go, oh, it's really good because we can put a junior developer with a senior developer and and that will solve the problem. But again, it's not about, I mean, it may help with mentoring in certain cases, but um, it's probably not the most effective thing that you would get from pair programming. So for me, pair programming is safe handling of large objects. So <laughs> when you're doing development, you are trying to deal with really sort of fine grained things like the, the syntax that you're using in a particular language and solving a compiler or writing a very small test. And you're trying to think about the story that you're, you're writing and whether you're going down a rabbit hole and doing the wrong thing and the overall you know, benefit of, of the product. So you're trying to deal with these things at quite different levels. And to me, pair programming is about handling that. And if you know, different people, when, when you're pairing in different ways, you should be doing slightly, slightly different things. Somebody who's dealing with something very fine grained, uh, maybe someone else should be helping keep the direction and, and, and things like that. I completely forgot what that was for a minute. That was really <laughs> weird. <laughs> I didn't have this the first time I did it, I added it the second time and I completely, I was like, what the hell? Okay, so talking about pairing, obviously we should also talk about mobbing. Obviously that's what that is. Um, yeah, this is the, the, my favorite um, sort of description. I guess it's the f obvious follow on from pairing is to, to work in, in bigger groups. And actually most teams that I know do work in slightly bigger groups. So they'll quite often do three amigos or they'll do uh, huddles on, uh, you know, pre-story huddles or they'll do swarming on particular issues. And I guess mobbing is taken to this point uh, where, where the idea is you know, nearly all the work happens with the whole team in a whole place. And I think one of the important things on this is that the same space doesn't actually mean the same physical space necessarily. It's the, you know, it's the same time and, and you, know, you can do it remotely. I think Hunter Technologies is one of the main people that have done a lot of mobbing and a lot of what they do is actually, they have a lot of remote workers. Um, so they, they will work in one central space but they'll also have people remoting in and they'll have people joining the mob and leaving the mob. Um, and it works that way. The, the, the book to read, uh, you know, I've not done much mobbing, so I'm not going to try and tell you how to do it, but Woody Zool's book is great. If you see Woody talk on this, all of the, um, the illustrations in his presentations and the book are done by his wife, who is a children's illustrator, so it's a very endearing sort of book and, and presentations. But he actually talks about some examples of some one, progr one programmer versus mob programmer examples and from a, a cost perspective and I think that you know the, the thing was was there was more more invested in the actual uh, implementation but the you know that was dramatic you know the cost was dramatically reduced in terms of the quality and and the you know not having to re revisit things so uh, how many people here have actually tried mob programming so okay, okay so refactoring yeah. <laughs> refactoring is not rewriting a code base um, depending on how you you take the definition of refactoring of, of small changes. Um, but to me, refactoring is a combination of um, sort of uh, well-being and uh, you know, a little bit of maintenance. And actually, I think of refactoring, I think of three distinct types of refactoring when I think about refactoring. Refactoring actually gets used really badly, as you probably 
seen. So, you know, tech debt, refactoring, MVP are all terms that kind of get horribly abused in the same way. But I see three, three versions. So I see refactoring for, for hygiene. So this is the, um, the kind of the Boy Scout rule or the, the next dev that will touch this code base is an axe murderer kind of rule, which is, and, and this is typically done uh, after, a, after a piece of functional coding and it's about cleaning up um, things so you've left it in a way that you, you would want other people to find it. Uh, the second type is preparatory. So this is where you know what you're going to do, but before you actually want to make any functional changes or write any new failing tests, you refactor it to get it into a format that will accept your, your change better. And then the third sort is, is exploratory, which is you know, if, you, if you need to get used to a new code base, doing a bit of refactoring, um, you know, ideally in a pair, is a really good way of sort of understanding a code base that you've not worked in before. Okay, and continuous integration isn't using Jenkins. Um, I've had a situation where we, we, we went into a new team and they said, yes, we're using continuous integration. And everybody was happy. They got a big tick in the box. And a day later, I went and said, oh, can we have a look at the CI? And they said, oh, no, it's, it's switched off. <laughs> <laughs> we switched it off last month because it was taking too long. But we're going to do it next sprint. It's this classic. We're going to do it next sprint. So they, they weren't doing CI. Um, so yeah, CI is I guess it's a bit of a lame one, but it's, it's being, being ready. Um, so I think the, the definition, I'm going to have to read it because I'm tired. Um, the, the definition of CI that I like from Jess Humble, uh, or I think Jess Humble, but Martin Fowler talked about it as well. But all developers commit to trunk at least once a day. So any branching fans here? You're not here. Um, every commit triggers a build, and failures are fixed in minutes, not, not hours. So a lot of people claim to be doing CI, but they're, they're kind of not because things stay red for, for hours, or, or they, they only have nightly builds, or um, they're not committing to, to, to trunks. So I think a lot of people don't, don't really do what they claim to be doing. Um, CI is also not CD. So if we're going to talk about continuous delivery, um, I think CI is required for CD, but you can certainly be doing, uh, but lots of other things are as well. So definition of continuous delivery is that it's depo deployable th throughout its life cycle. Uh, we prioritize deployability over new features. Uh, we have automated feedback on readiness and push button deploy of any version to any environment on demand. So this is the idea you know, continuous delivery to me is, is about the idea that you are you're always ready to go and the the critical path to releasing new software is is a decision to release it rather than the mechanisms of, of having to release it. And those mechanisms aren't just technical mechanisms, so it's not requiring like elaborate sign off from fifteen parties in you know in blood on a contract, et cetera, et cetera. So the, 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 those are the four uh, definitions of things that you have to be doing to be claiming um, continuous delivery. And the, the things that you require um, in, or, in order to achieve that is really around collaboration and automation. So as I say, this is my, my definition. I like the no panic piece. And we tell, I know there's a number of people in this room that I talk about frequently around the, the low ceremony that you have in, in releases. So I think people in this room are doing, doing this more than I could ever have claimed to. <laughs> I think that's the last one. <coughs> Fine. Um, so <laughs> I'm not really in a position to talk about this too much because I don't know much about it. So all I'm going to say in terms of this is when I say it, all of I think is like band name. Yeah? <laughs> this is a genuinely really good resource. So rather than talking about uh, at scale, this is you know, Joshua Karievsky's. I had to censor it because it's obviously modern agility. Um, but it, it, he does some presentations on it which are available on YouTube. And it's just, to me, it, when, when I first saw it, I was just like, that. Yeah, you know, this is what development is about you know, now in, in 2016. I think these are things that we, we try to do and we don't always do, but I like the, um, the, the combination of real sort of specific, tangible, um, you know, practical measures along with you know, why we do them and, and what the values are, are behind them. But I guess going from 2016 uh, back, to, uh, 20, uh, to back to 2001, obviously, um, BBC News look like look like this. Do you remember? This is there is a low graphics version. This isn't a low graphics version. This is actually today, uh, 2001. Um, Apple's latest release was the first version, first generation iPod. Um, but obviously, the other thing that happened in 2001 was a group of people came out of uh, a ski resort in Utah with a document, which I guess we could call a, a manifesto. Would that be a fair? A fair description. So obviously you guys are all really familiar with it. What are the three most important words on the manifesto? It's fine. It's a hypothetical question. I don't want you to answer <laughs> it. Not necessarily. It's 
good. I don't think they're the most important. This carries on. These are not the most. See what I did there? No. These are not the most important three words to me. The most important three words on the manifesto to me are... Do you remember where that is up at the top? Yep. By doing it. So much of people talking about agility and transformation and everything else seem to be people not actually doing it. You know, the whole point of this conversation was the people were selected because they were out there doing actual software development and actually delivering value. Um, and, and it sometimes feels like that is, that is being, being lost. So, you know, maybe if we sort of went back to some of this stuff and we thought about you know, doing this, maybe by doing some of these things, most of all, responding to change, you know, maybe that's our definition of agility, then maybe we can, can get rid of this whole thing. And no booing, please, just rapturous applause will do at this point. But maybe we can get rid of this and we can get back to this. <laughs> Thank you. Too kind.